This week we are going to build some electronics and I'm going to take you through the process from start to finish. So what are we building? We are building one of my slurry equip control systems. So basically it reads a flow meter, controls two hydraulic relays, has Bluetooth to link to a tablet so you can do GPS mapping of your slurry applications, all of that sort of stuff. It sounds like a complicated product and it is a complicated product but every single part of it is built right here in this room from PCB design, from the code which runs on the device to 3D printing the cases. Everything is done right here and I'm gonna take you through the entire process. The design comes in two halves. First half we have to build is the control system. It has a touchscreen interface and this sits in your tractor cab. The second half is a box which mounts on the machine and it connects to the control system via this large waterproof connector. We're not gonna to worry too much about that. We are gonna focus on the control box because it is the much more interesting side. So here is all of the parts, well, almost all of the parts that we need to build one control system. We'll start from this end. We have the cases that go in the machines. We have the clamps to mount the box in the cab. We have the relays which are inside the cases to handle the higher voltage of the large hydraulic actuators. We have the waterproof connectors which break at the back window of the tractor so you never have to remove the control box from your cab. We have the touchscreen LCDs. We have the 3D printed cases which I am currently printing another two at the minute. They are made out of a material called ASA and it is rock solid. I have a huge bin of rejects because every print is not perfect. To give you an idea of how strong these ASA cases are, let me try and break one by standing on it. This might really hurt, I could stab my foot. That is 100 kilograms of weight. Didn't even damage it. These things are genuinely impossible to break. Today's video is sponsored by PCBWay. I have used them as a customer for many years and they reached out to sponsor me for these electronics videos and I am very, very grateful. I'll give you more details on what they offer later in the video. If we move over to our uh, PCB side, we have our printed circuit board, which I designed in a program called Eagle. Then we have our buzzers. We have our transistor arrays, which are basically like switches. We have a Bluetooth chip so that you can connect it to an Android phone and map your GPS position. We have our voltage converter, which takes the 12 volts from the tractor down to five volts. We have our processor, which holds all the code and controls all of the functions. Then this is a six pin connector, which goes out to the actual machine. Then finally, we have an LED, some resistors and a diode. And finally, we have little tiny buttons whose purpose is to set the memory if you ever need to reset the device. The first job in the manufacturing process is to build the PCBs. For that, we use this giant stencil to place solder paste onto the PCBs. Then we set our components on top of that solder paste and we cook the whole thing on this thing here, which heats up to 230 degrees centigrade. And that melts our solder paste, and then that is our finished PCB. So I need to populate another board. Um, so the first thing we're gonna add is our Bluetooth chip. And then we are gonna line that up with the pads. Next thing we're gonna add is our switch. This is called a transistor array. Next thing we're gonna add is the LED, which I forgot to add when we were adding all the tiny little parts. Turn around. Then we're gonna add our computer. 
our microcontroller more accurately. I use an awful lot of Raspberry Pi Picos. I think they're an incredible um, microprocessor. They're very, very, very good. That's the next PCB ready. We'll now check that this PCB has all soldered correctly, which it has. So let's pull that off and set it to one side to cool down. And we will add the one that we just finished. And we repeat the process. I find that this method of PCB manufacture with surface mount components and a heat plate to melt the solder, it's not much faster than just manually soldering through whole components, but it is a lot more enjoyable to do. Right, I am gonna work away and get the next five of these finished, and I'll catch up with you after lunch when we will add in some through hole components to the PCBs. We will mount the screens onto the PCBs. We will program the Bluetooth chips and then we will upload the code to each one of the devices, check everything's working and then mount them into their cases. So, so the next step in building our PCBs is to add the through hole components. So we have to add a buzzer we have to add the connector, the pin header connector, which allows us to plug in our touchscreen LCD. And then the final two parts are two little plastic connectors. One is for the cable going out to the machine and the other is for programming the Bluetooth chip, which we soldered onto the PCB earlier. So that is our finished PCB. Everything soldered together. It is ready to be attached to a screen and it simply attaches on the pins. This is a three and a half inch touchscreen LCD. And that is it all connected together. So I am gonna finish soldering the rest of these PCBs in peace. I'll get a wee podcast on or something. I find this job very relaxing and quite enjoyable. And I will be done in about 40 minutes and then I'll catch up with you then. We will get the Bluetooth chips programmed. We have to do that before we put the screens on. Then we will add the screens and then we will upload the code to finally get all of this working, get the touchscreen interface working, and then we are ready to stick them into the plastic orange cases that are sitting right over there. Okay, so welcome back to day two of building my slurry equip control boxes. In reality, this is like a week later. We've had Christmas in between and I get nothing done over Christmas week. So we need to get 10 of these boxes finished today, basically. So this is where I'm gonna be for the next eight or nine or 10 hours. And I'm gonna give you a uh, quick update on what I'd done in the last week when I had a few minutes. It's not really a lot. And then we'll get back in to building a control box. This is actually gonna be my new office. So it's kind of like half finished. I have to furnish it, add some shelving, paint the walls, etc. But for now, this is like a prep storage area. So this is the rest of our casings. I have four more in there. so. I'm gonna take these with us. And then the backs and a few more cases were all sprayed yesterday. So all of these plastic cases get a spray coating, which is like a lacquer. You can see it's really shiny and it just makes it much easier to wipe them clean. So these cases can sit over here. You'll notice as well that the little screw hole metal things have been already melted in as well. So these cases are now ready to go. I've also got the machine size cases prepared with the five waterproof glands on them. 
and then this assembly goes into each one and this basically controls the two high powered relays which our little orange box turns on and off so we're not going to get into this part of the build in this video because it's not that interesting to be honest but essentially our big seven core control cable comes in here connects into this block of connectors and drives the relays and then that is what turns on and off the hydraulic solenoids and our flow meter also connects in to this bundle of cables. So the first things that we are going to do that I'm going to show you today is to create all 10 of these cables. So we already have this connector soldered on. We're going to pass it through the back of our case through this waterproof grub screw and then on the inside we need to fit a six pin connector and this then plugs in to our PCB right here. So this is a really good part of the design, I guess. It means if you have any problems, you can very quickly change the cable. Say you break the cable or cut it, or if you have a problem with your PCB, it's very easy to change. And then after we've done that step, we mount the screens into their plastic housings, and it will look something like this. And we have to wire up the switch and solder it onto the PCB right here. And that breaks both the positive and the negative side of the connection. And that prevents any um, like stray voltage passing through the PCB that's not meant to in case something does short on the other side of the control box. So just to quickly recap before we get into today's build, we have went from a blank PCB to a PCB mounted on the screen and we are going to end up with the PCB mounted to the screen in a plastic casing with a switch attached which then plugs into the back of this, seals the unit up and we have our completed machine side box which I showed you at the start of the video. I can only apologize if this video is all over the place. It very much reflects my state of mind at the minute. Christmas week is always just a bit crazy. So the first thing we have to do this morning is upload the new code to these boards and it is brand new code. I went through over the last few days when I had a spare few hours and rewrote the entire code for these systems. Um, it would just got very messy from a year of adding bits on, changing things and I had to go and add another new feature and it just got so messy and so confusing that I was just like, right, no more of these shortcuts. We're rewriting the whole code. So that's what I'd done over the last few days. So this is kind of new, untested code. I have tested it, but I'm gonna to have to be careful. I don't make any mistakes. So we're gonna upload the code to these and I've already programmed the Bluetooth chip. And um, that is just so that it can connect to an app on my phone. I'll show you the app and stuff at the end of this video as well. We have a window on this side and this is our controller and we just have to drag the file from the left window to the right window and that will upload the code. And as that's uploading, we need to hold this little button here, which is like a program button and that initializes our memory so that we have something in memory to read from. And that's it. Okay, so that is our code uploaded and then we get to do a very satisfying peel and take the cover off the screen. Right, I will do the other 10 of these and make sure I don't get confused by which are done and which is not done. Probably want to check the Bluetooth chip works as well. I normally don't do this step, but I have been caught out a few times with um, the Bluetooth chips that I solder onto the board just not working. So it's probably easier to check now than to check when they're all in their cases. So I'm scanning for available devices. Can you imagine if the first one I test doesn't work? <laughs> okay, so there's our, our Bluetooth device. So we know this is gonna work, so let's move on to the next one. Okay. 
I have done all of these. I have two more left to do, and I'm going to show you the process. Um, it's a lot more difficult than I'm going to hopefully make it look, but we have to push the screen in at the top, and it locks into these two little connector things. And then whenever we push the screen down, we need to make sure that the top edge is not catching because that can cause uh, damage to the screen. So that should be okay. And then we just pop the screen in and it locks in with these two side connectors. And then there's little bumpers down here at the bottom edge which hold the screen in place. And that is our screen mounted and it's rock solid, not moving anywhere. And then I'll give it a wee wipe with a cloth to take any fingerprints off it. Okay, final one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yes, this will be ten. Okay, so that is our ten cases finished. Now we need to mount the buttons that go inside this. It is a fairly straightforward process. Um, I will show you one and then I'll get on and do the rest off camera. So like everything, our buttons need to be removable so that we can swap out the PCB. So we use little crimp lock connectors um, to do that. These are quite expensive, to be honest, especially when they come pre-wired, but um, I'm willing to pay for it because otherwise this would take a long time. And we just push them on to the buttons. And once they're on, Believe me, they ain't coming off because I have had to take them off before and I just broke the switch. So they are very much as good as soldering. They're almost too good at staying on. So again, like I said earlier, we are switching both the positive and the negative. And it wasn't always that way. At the start, we were only switching the negative. But then we had grinding issues going through the signal line and all sorts of stuff. So the better solution was just to buy a double switch and grind both. And we have four pads down here, which is where these solder into to actually switch the power. The power for these comes from the white box on the machine and comes down our seven core cable. So this switches it just as it comes into the PCB. And before I solder this in, I need to put it through the hole for the switch. That would have been embarrassing. This is a wee bit footery. In case you're not from Northern Ireland, that means like, is that a word in the rest of the UK, footery? It takes a little bit of patience. Right, I'm going to solder the two positive connections on first, and then I'll do these two. Same idea, we're just pushing them through the hole, soldering them into the PCB from the top side, so they're easy to remove, and then I'm going to push the switch in, so we end up with this. So I'm going to do 10 of these and I'll catch up with you then when we're going to build some of these cables with our connector on the end. So I have two of these boxes left to do. It is now 2 p.m. so it's two hours since I left you in the last clip and I had to go get my lunch and then I had to open the fifth cut silage pit because we need to feed our fifth cut to get to our second cut before we run out of first cut. That will make sense if you're a farmer, which I'm assuming most of you are. And my hands stink of effluent now. I really should have washed them, but I forgot and I can't be bothered at this point. It will be interesting to know if these take longer or less time than people imagined they would. They take about an hour and a half of labor per box. And I do have some people that come and help me do the more basic jobs, I guess, the stuff which I can trust people with. But in general, I have to do them all myself because one, it's much more difficult to do all of this than I make it look. I suppose I've done 250 of them, so I've got pretty good at them. But also, I cannot afford any mistakes. And so I just try to do all of the bits where if someone messed up, 
it might affect the reliability. I try to do all in bits myself. So that is our stack finished. We have 10 ready to go. Next, we are going to get these cables all wired in through the back cases, plugged into these and screwed together. So to mount our control systems in our tractor cabs, most other controllers, products that sit in tractors, they use suction cups to go in your windows. But my experience of suction cups has always been that they suck. They never stay on. If it's something you have to take out and in of your tractor, the suction cups get dirty. They just don't work well. So I decided I would use these little clamps. So they can clamp onto flat bar, they can clamp onto round bar, they can clamp onto loads of stuff in your tractor cab. And because our control boxes are nice and small, this is a really good solution. And this has a quarter inch thread on the end of it that we have to screw into. And what we screw into is this little brass insert, okay? So the way that we get this brass insert into our control box, I suppose, is that we melt the brass insert into the back of the plastic casing. And inside this, although you can't see it, um, there is tons of plastic supports printed in there with a really thick plastic shroud. And all of that is designed to hold this little thing. So let's do that now. This is another one of them processes which I have perfected through um, essentially trial and error. You want a 300 degrees solder tip. Any hotter and your plastic will bubble and fill the threads and any colder and it doesn't melt the plastic enough to get a good grip. And we push the insert in slowly until it's just below the surface. And we pull out our iron. And if there is a little bit of plastic, which there is in this case, that is unusual, we just use a little screwdriver to get rid of it. Like that. And that is our finished inserted connection. And that will not come out. You'll have to break the casing to get that out. So I have another few more to do, and then I'll catch up with you at the next stage. Next up, we add all of our little glands, our waterproof cable glands, into our casings. And this is what takes the cable, the seven core control cable, into our little boxes. So now we have our pile of back printed bits. I don't know what to call them. I don't actually have a name for them um, already. And then the next stage is to prepare the cables so that they are like this with the little tiny connectors. Now this is a slow process. So I'm probably gonna be at this for the next hour. So whilst I am doing this job, I'll give you a little bit of background into how I ended up on this design with a touchscreen computer and building them all by hand because I'm sure many of you are thinking to yourselves, why do you not just buy something to do this job? Why am I doing everything in this one room from the very start of raw, tiny little components and PCBs coming from China to finished products? So there is very few companies left in the UK and Ireland that will build you custom electronics hardware. So by hardware, I mean everything you're watching me do now. There's plenty of companies will write you software, build you an app, stick it on a tablet for you, but most avoid hardware. And there's a good reason why the intelligent people and the smart companies avoid hardware and that's because hardware is hard. It gives problems, it takes a long time to develop, it's expensive to develop, whereas software is very easy, quick, profitable. So everyone sticks to software. But the opportunity for me to do this, set up a business, 
sell things like this, sell things like my GPS systems, is that I am willing to work in that interface between hardware and software. And I can do both, I can do both fairly well. And that gives me, in my opinion, that gives me significant advantages. If we stick specifically to these control systems, which read a flow meter um, and control large hydraulic relay banks or valves, um, the other companies who use a tablet, they have to build hardware anyway. There's no way you can interface a software app with the physical world without some hardware. So what they essentially choose to do is use a Bluetooth device to communicate between the hardware and their app. And that was originally what I was going to do as well. That is what I was asked to do is to build the electronics which interface through Bluetooth with a tablet computer and an app. And I sat down to think about it and start designing it. And I had settled on using the little computers which I'm currently using on my PCBs to do the control systems and to communicate over Bluetooth. And then the realization sort of hit me that there was no reason that I could not add an LCD screen to the box, which was simply meant to send the information to a tablet. And by adding that LCD screen, I was able to get rid of the tablet in most cases. And there is a lot of advantages to using a little LCD screen versus the tablet. Not only is it cheaper, but it's much more functional for the purpose of what it's being used for. I know how annoying it is to have to load up a tablet and open an app every time you want to use a machine. Whereas with my little boxes, you flick a switch, it's straight there in front of you and you're ready to go. Right, I have another nine of these to do. So, so we are nearly finished building these units. The last step that we have to do is put the backs onto the cases, plug in this cable to the PCB, and then screw the cases closed. Then we have to put a sticker on the front of the cases just for a little bit of branding and it makes them look a lot better. And then the very final step of this stage of the build is to test it. And to do that, we use a flow rate simulator. So let's get these all joined together, get the backs on the cases and get them tested. At this stage, I do them one at a time. So I will show you the process of doing one and then I'll wrap this video up because it's nearly milking time. So here's all our screen backs. Every one of them has this little connector. And over here we have all of our cases. So we're going to grab one of our cases. Oh, my desk is so dirty. Let me tidy this up for a second. That's good enough. We're going to grab one of our cases and we plug this connector in. Uh, yeah, doing this with one hand is not going to be possible. Let me put the camera down. So we tighten down our cable crimp thing, gland. I suppose is what it's called. And then we just pop our case cover on and it clicks in, there's two little clicks on either side here. And then we need our screws, I'll be right back. We take our screws, dip them in the thread lock. And this is sealing our case up. Now we place our sticker on the front of our control system. This is done by eye. I probably should use a guide, but um, I've got fairly good at it. And we'll give the screen a wee wipe. Now, this is the crucial test. Um, we're gonna plug this in and we're gonna check that everything works. I genuinely have not tested this. The 
9.5% will work when I flick the switch. Happy days. So next thing we have to do is validate the calibration. Every single unit is calibrated using this little flow meter generator. Um, so I can't read the screen, but you can read the screen. I can't see it in my little time screen. So um, it should now be reading 280 meters cubed. I can see it's reading 277. So we're gonna recalibrate this unit, make sure it's exactly 280. And the test of accuracy, which I use, is I set it to 12 milliamps, which should read 140. So I can see it's reading 139. So it's only off by less than 1%, but we're gonna recalibrate it to get it spot on. So to recalibrate it, I have to, wait, I shouldn't show you the secret menu. No, I'm not gonna show you the secret menu because then I'll have people going into the secret menu out of interest and then breaking the boxes. So let me go into the secret menu and then I'll get back to you. Okay, I am in the secret menu. So we are gonna set our two values. One value is equal to zero meters cubed through your flow meter. The second value is gonna be equal to 280 meters cubed. And once we have them two values, it's a straight line. So we can then read any value along that line. So the first and last value are the two important ones for setting and calibrating these flow meters. So the, our first value is sitting between 162 and 163. Uh, I'm gonna hit save when it goes to, uh, it doesn't matter, I'll just hit save at any point. And then our second value is going to be equal to 20 milliamps or 280 meters cubed. So I scroll my little flow meter simulator up and it'll read like 813, I think, is the normal default calibration. So we're reading 809. So that sounds about right. So uh, I will save it at 809 and that should get us, if not exactly on 280 meters cubed, like 279, so within like less than half a percent. So it is now reading 279 meters cubed. And when we go to 12 milliamps, I went under, sorry, it'll read like 139 or 140, so 139. So we're within like half a percent. That's as good as I'm going to get using whole numbers of meters cubed because there is a little bit of variation in it. The next part of the process, which I'm not going to show you because it's not that interesting, it's essentially clicking some wires together, is soldering up the other half of the connectors, which I still have to do. They're all still sitting in a pile behind me. I will do that probably after milking. It'll take me like 30 or 40 minutes. And then connecting together the cables inside the machine side box, which is the white box. So this is the second one that has been finished. It does not take long to stick the back on. We're gonna turn it on. It should read 139, 140, 141, something like that. 139, so that is within half a percent. So I'm not gonna change the calibration. And then the final thing we have to do before we say this unit is good is check the buttons. Actually, I lied, that's not the final thing. I also need to check that the Bluetooth is working properly. And I didn't do that in the other one and I do not want to forget that. So let me get my phone. So I have paired the box with my phone and now I can go and open the Slurry Equip app, which I made. So it is reading 139 and our box is reading 139. And if I change our little flow meter simulator, the value on my phone also changes. So you may wonder why do we have an app if we already have our touchscreen control box here. And the reason is that this app allows us to GPS map our applications, which is needed for some grant schemes. And you can then go in and send your data from the phone over your 4G connection to my server. And on my server, it will make you a variable application map and I'll email that back to you. So if you imagine the data chain from all of this, this box is just recording our flow rate and nothing else. The tablet is then allowing us to take that flow rate and pair it to a GPS position. And then that file is then sent over the 4G on your phone 
to the database, which means that it can be emailed to your email address. So the whole process of getting data out is meant to be seamless. Once again, I want to say thank you to PCBWay for sponsoring this week's video. Not only are they a fantastic company to deal with, but they offer incredibly fast build times of just 24 hours with delivery to the UK of just two to four business days at a very, very competitive price. They don't just offer PCBs or PCB stencils like you've seen in this video. They also offer CNC machining, 3D printing, steel metal fabrication and even injection molding. So head over to the website and check out what they can offer for you and your business at PCBWay.com. Hopefully you've enjoyed that video and learned a little tiny bit along the way. It's not many farmer YouTube channels that also do electronics and PCB manufacture so I thought I would share this little niche part of my life with you all. We have went from a blank PCB at the start of this video to a populated PCB with our controller and our Bluetooth chip and our power supply. We've added the code, we've added the screen, we have printed the cases and we have ended up with a functional control system that looks like this. So I hope you've enjoyed being part of the video. If you did, give this video a like, it really helps. And if you have any questions, any comments, stick them down below. And if you'd like to see more of this sort of stuff, let me know. It's sort of like, I don't think people are that interested in it, but maybe for a few people, they are immensely interested in this. Um, so give me some guidance, I'd appreciate that as well. And if you wish, you're more than welcome to subscribe to my YouTube channel and ring that little bell. So every Saturday when I upload a video, you'll get a notification. I mean, if I was a true professional YouTuber, I would have this sitting in a nice clean environment, but that's just not me.